Welcome to Accounting High. I want to clarify. So CFO stands for Chief Financial Officer. It's not a certification like a CPA designation. CPA designation, you have to take a test. There's years of experience required. There's standards. CFO, literally anybody could say, I am a CFO. Well, and usually that term is reserved for the C-suite at a company. So somebody's hired as a CFO. We would hope the person doing the hiring, at least, is hiring somebody that's qualified. They're being called a CFO at the company. You're saying out there in this world, people are calling themselves fractional CFOs, and they have no business calling themselves that. And it's confusing for buyers because they see CFO, and so in their mind, they put a premium on what they're willing to pay. And that's why people use it as a marketing tool. And for a long time, I was afraid to even put CFO on our website because I felt like it was false advertisement. And then the longer I go on, I realize all these people that say they're CFOs are full of and like we're doing way they more than they're doing. Check out the cash flow show. We discuss topics like getting paid on time, profitability, and managing your bottom line, payroll best practices, the best apps to use, and cash flow forecasting tools. So if you're a small business owner, your help's right around the corner. Fret not. Tune in as Scott and Nicole help you reach your goals on the cash flow show. The cash flow show. What's up, Nicole? Hey, good morning, Scotty. How's it going? Pretty good. Just busy. 1099s are due today. I didn't do any of ours, but you know how it is when the rest of your team is busy. You feel bad delegating things, so everybody gets busy. Do you feel bad? Do I feel bad? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Do you feel bad bit. delegating things? You probably shouldn't. No, I don't. And I'm just like, but I, I still, I can tell when the team's got, you know, it's January. It's our busy season, so... There are things that I would like to start delegating now that we've done some internal restructuring. I'm just waiting for them to get a little less busy. We just hired two or one person from the Philippines, our first offshore hire, Ooh. and have another one we're interviewing. So First offshore. Yeah, but it's just going to allow us to be able to do more at a more competitive rate for our clients. So I'm excited. Competitive rates. That, I heard that too. Are you adjusting your pricing? Yeah. I mean, we're getting more and more, you know, we've always positioned ourselves as a fractional accounting department. So we are consistently getting people that want us to do outsource everything, invoicing, special commission calculation, things that are just a little bit more tedious that we can't automate with technology. And previously it was just like really expensive for us to do that kind of work because our team are all like controller level people, senior account level people in the US. And so it's just going to allow us to do everything for our clients and make it more reasonable. So you said you position yourselves as a fractional accounting department. We're going to talk about accounting departments today. You are an accounting department. Is that how you see yourself? Is that how you see Momentum? That's exactly right. And, and I think there's a challenge in our industry right now because it's changed over the last 10 years and even more so in the last five years. If we think about traditionally how business owners have handled their finances and accounting, traditionally, you had somebody in-house, someone that came to your office, bookkeeper typically was the title of this person, and then you had your tax accountant, and that was really the only support that you had managing the financial side of your business. Now, with outsourcing, uh, which is what we do, it's created a lot of market confusion. And so when business owners are looking for a solution, they are looking for a bookkeeper, they're looking for a CFO. Most people don't know what a controller is. And so they're looking for roles that typically would be an in in-house, you know, you'd have a job description for this person and that would be their title. But we need to change our thinking, I think, now and think less about what are the who is the what's the title of the person I need. And instead of thinking about that, think what are the tasks that need to get done within my accounting function so that my vendors get paid, 
my customers pay me, I can pay my employees. And at the end of the day, I have financial information that I can use in real time to make good business decisions. And so the topic today are, it's called the roles within an accounting department, but really it's going to be more about what are the tasks and accountability within an accounting and finance department? And how do you as a business owner identify where there are gaps? So then when you're looking for a solution, you can come with, here's specifically what I need accomplish rather than I need a bookkeeper, I need a CFO, because we'll get into it in a minute here, but anybody can call themselves a CFO. And a lot of times bookkeepers are doing more than a lot of just bookkeeping. And then, you know, there's all these other titles that we'll get into here in a minute and hopefully demystify some of these things. Yeah. And looking at, at it holistically, like this is a department and not just a fragmented, okay, this person does this, this person does this, and I have this person that's handling my 1099s, but I have somebody else that's doing my taxes. Like we, we need to consolidate a lot of it too. Right. And just identifying what are all, all of these tasks that get done within an AP process. It's, you know, if you break it down, there's 20 things that needs to happen in an AP process. So you can't just say, I need a bookkeeper. And then the bookkeeper does AP, AR, transaction booking. And and yeah, it just doesn't work like that anymore. And we, we're speaking to small business owners. And as with anything, small businesses start out micro. They start out real small. The owners tends to be doing a lot of these things or their processes kind of evolve over time. They get somebody helping out. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's somebody handling the QuickBooks. And so these roles kind of develop or they evolve over time too. But get it going from that small under a million size to then 1 million plus, you run into new problems and new roles are defined. So that's what we're going to talk about today is getting rid of that role mindset and start looking at this holistically like an entire department. Exactly. Let's just talk about... So are well, we flipping the script on roles? <laughs> a little bit. I think so. I think this is where our industry is going. I really do. This is this is like the meat and potatoes of, of everything that we do. It really is. Let's stay with the roles and then let's break down traditionally what those titles, the tasks that those titles do, because then that will lead into, okay, what are the functional roles that need to get done? The main roles in a bigger business accounting department, you would have a bookkeeper, these, and, and there might be some levels in between for very large organizations, but this is the main, these are the main ones. So bookkeeper would be the, the one, and that's the most commonly used term, I would say. But typically bookkeeper is doing transaction input. So they are entering transactions into your accounting software. They might be paying bills. They might be sending out invoices. They may be doing some payroll administration. And then Above the bookkeeper would be a controller. A controller is, a lot of business owners aren't familiar with that term. And the controller is really the most important part of a business that's doing over a million dollars in revenue. That's when you start to feel that friction when you hit a million. And you might think, oh, I need more mid-level support. Whatever solution I'm using right now is not working anymore. And the controller's job is more about outputs. Bookkeepers inputs, controllers outputs. So the controller is doing a month end close. They're looking at your financials analytically and saying, do these margins make sense? Are we on accrual based accounting? Do our revenue match our expenses? And, and they're preparing the financial data for the business owner and communicating that to the business owner. They're the reviewers and the translators reviewing the bookkeeping and then translating it to the decision maker. That's right. And then they also be managing the other functional areas that the bookkeeper is doing, right? So if the bookkeeper is managing accounts receivable, the controller is setting policies around, hey, we need to get paid within 15 days or we need to get paid within 30 days. And if we're not, they're managing the bookkeeper essentially to make sure that they're doing their job. And then on the AP side, same thing. They're setting up approval policies and setting up controls so your business doesn't get stolen from. So it's kind of like a higher level bookkeeper. And a bookkeeper can, from a career trajectory, can grow into a controller. And then you have different levels of controllers. People have come from public accounting. So people who have done financial statement audits might come over and be a controller. I'm getting a little bit more technical here, but the career path for a controller, typically you know how to do accrual-based accounting or you have some sort of gap accounting experience. 
So a CPA could be applying for a controller position at a private company. Is that right? Right. Like they may start in public and then they'll apply for a controller role in a, in a private company, or they might come to an outsourced accounting firm like Momentum. Like my background is I have my, I had my CPA license at the moment it's expired because I don't (laughs) use it because I'm not issuing financial statements and I'm not signing tax returns. But that experience I had as a CPA is super valuable for what I do now. So you have to change your screen names from Nicole, the CPA to something else. I got my domain for for Momentum Accounting used to be MomentumCPA.com. And that was confusing because we got a lot of inquiries about taxes. But I didn't know. Uh, When I first started the business, I didn't know. I I figured I would do some sort of taxes and then I didn't end up doing that. Uh, Yeah. As with most accountants these days, they're getting out of the taxes and running peaceful firms. But let's move on. And we we already kind of discussed that. But did you go into uh, the CFO? Yeah. And so controller is typically everything backwards looking. So they may be doing some data analysis and KPIs for you, but typically it's backwards looking. There are some controllers that will prepare forward looking reports for a CFO. So I think of CFO as somebody who's helping you plan for the future. So they're taking whatever, and there's different levels of CFOs. There's strategic CFOs, And then there's more of like financial planning and analysis, like task-focused CFOs. So let me just clarify what I mean by that. And that's why when we get into like the tasks that actually need to get done, it'll make more sense, right? Because part of forward-looking is you may have forecasts, you may have cash plans, you may have hiring plans, and those need to be prepared and maintained on a regular cadence. And then you also have someone that needs to come in and help you with strategy. So if you are a business owner and you want to grow your business from 5 million to 20 million, the role of a strategic CFO is to come in as an advisor and help you do that. A CFO that's more task-based can come in and help you prepare forecasts, scenarios, things like that. And even your controller might be able to do that. And I want to clarify, so CFO stands for Chief Financial Officer. It's not a certification like a CPA designation. CPA designation, you have to take a test. There's years of experience required. There's standards. CFO, literally anybody could say, I am a CFO. Well, and usually that term is reserved for the C-suite at a company too. So somebody's hired as a CFO, we would hope the person doing the hiring at least is hiring somebody that's qualified in the first place. So they're being called a CFO at the company. You're saying out there in this world, people are calling themselves fractional CFOs and they have no business calling themselves that. That's right. And it's confusing for buyers because they see CFO and so in their mind, They put a premium on what they're willing to pay. And that's why people use it as a marketing tool. And for a long time, I was afraid to even put CFO on our website because I felt like it was false advertisement. And then the longer I go on, I realize all these people that say they're CFOs are full of and like we're doing way more than they're doing. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So how about let's throw another acronym in there and CFP. A CFP is a designation, is a certification. Are CFPs CFOs? No. So CFPs are more focused on individual financial planning, which is completely different than understanding the levers in a business. Not and to CFP say that- CFP stands for Certified Financial Planner. Right. Yeah. So they're okay. typically working with families or individuals and helping optimize their personal cash, which, you know, if you're getting your cash from your business, it all ties in. But yeah, it's a, just a different type of service. More for the individual. Okay. So your hierarchy is your bookkeeper. That's the person that was managing your QuickBooks. That's your lower level. You go up from the bookkeeper. The controller is the bridge between the next level and the bookkeeper. And the last, that next level is the CFO. Right. It's the top of the hierarchy when it comes to the internal accounting department. It's supposed to be. But again, beware because there are a lot of people that say that they're a CFO and they're not very good. Yeah, you should look for somebody that was a CFO at a company too. Like a lot of times people will be CFOs and then they'll transition to the more public sphere too and go from that to, that's at least what Terrell did at his firm. Right. But also be careful because a lot, there'll be CFOs that will come from like public companies and then they'll come work with a small business. There's probably like a three-year learning curve 
that a public company CFO or someone who's working with really large enterprises needs to learn. And if you're looking for somebody that can also execute, those people are not going to get their hands dirty. Small businesses are the wild, wild west. You need somebody that yeah. come in that's a little bit scrappy and understands that. And sometimes those people coming from big businesses just aren't a good fit for a small business. So again, that's why you said that CFO is not a certification. So somebody that may have been held the title as CFO at a larger company may not be fully qualified then yep. to help your small business. And then we have some other certifications for the tax side of it that we'll talk about. I don't think these are on this hierarchy. They're just part of the function of an accounting department. Is that right? Yeah. I think of there's like the hierarchy internal and then these ones are external. So there's CPA and there's actually two main types of CPAs. So there's CPAs who do financial statement audits and those that most small businesses don't need a financial statement audit. Typically it's businesses, well, nonprofits typically need to get audits. Sometimes companies with investors that are like going to go public need to get financial statement audits. So that's and one time. public companies need it. And all, all, always public companies. So basically that's a third party coming in and saying your financials are legit. You're not doing anything fraudulent here because there's other people like investors or people donating that need somebody to come in and say, yeah, like we're, you know, there's no fraud going on here. The financials are legit. And then the second type of CPA is a CPA who does taxes. And then there's an EA who also does taxes. So uh, Scott, I'll let you describe the difference between a CPA and an EA and when you might use one or the other. One that does taxes, I don't see much of a difference at all. A lot of EAs get called CPAs all the time because everybody thinks CPAs do taxes. EAs only do taxes. That's the difference. You have CPAs that can do multiple things. A CPA could be working at a private company as the CFO. I mean, you, you see that sometimes, but CPAs could do public audits and they can also represent clients before the IRS. Those are the ones that do taxes. EAs can represent clients before the IRS. That's it. So CPAs can do multiple things and we always get, I'm saying we, I'm not even a CPA, I'm an EA. CPAs get lumped into tax preparers and EAs get called executive assistants. <laughs> yeah. EAs is a designation by the IRS. CPA is a designation by a state society. So your IRS is issuing EA for people that pass the exam and they are practicing tax preparers typically. So EAs, you know, they're doing taxes. Enrolled agent, right? Enrolled uh, agent. Uh, one Enrolled thing I'll, one thing I'll add the there, and the difference, I'm guessing, I didn't take the EA test, but I'm guessing, so the CPA has, it focuses on taxes, but it also is other areas where it focuses on financial reporting. Yeah, so the CA, CPA is four parts to that exam, and one of them focuses on taxes. The EA has three parts to its exam, and they all pretty much focus on taxes. One of them is sort of like an ethics type area, but it's all pretty much tax related. So if you want somebody that took an exam that was focused on taxes, that's the EA. Sometimes we have challenges working with EAs, like solo EAs that don't have an, a financial reporting background because we do everything on a cruel basis for financial reporting. And then they're familiar, more familiar with cash basis accounting. And so that can sometimes create friction. So there may be a point, and Scott, I know you have, guys have CPAs on your team and you have enough experience where on the financial reporting side, being a business owner and just working with businesses. But if you're feeling friction on that side, it could be that you need to graduate from an EA to a CPA firm. Yeah. Or, more or, robust firm. or no, or look at it like this person was hired to prepare the taxes and maybe you want somebody that can give you better insights into your financials if that tax preparer is not doing that. Because sure. that's the thing. It's poor communication. Tax preparers are condensed to this busy season and you can't get a hold of them and they're too busy to even think about these types of reporting requirements. So they just give the results of the tax return to the practicing accountants who's handling the books, let's say that's accrual, and then the accountant makes adjusting entries. That's typically what happens. And then the accountant and the tax preparer tend to have a fractured relationship. They tend to not get along because they're not speaking eye to eye. They're not speaking at all or they're not speaking clearly. Yeah, 
there's a lot of resentment between that, but the EAs are focused on the reporting agent and the compliance work and the reporting goes to the IRS and this is how the IRS wants it. So, yeah. And a lot of times when it comes to tax apply, it's all about experience. Mm -hmm. So I have empathy for both sides. I'm sort of stuck in the middle here as a, as a little speaker head for both. I represent both parties. Cool. Okay. So now that we've defined the traditional roles or titles, let's now move our focus to the functional roles or things that need to get done inside of an accounting and finance department. So I break it down to six main functional roles. The first one is accounts payable. And that is everything to do with paying your vendors. I would move up payroll and anything payroll close to the accounts payable. So, and that's, okay. that's the last one. I wasn't sure where to put the payroll one. It kind of was payroll like a floater is in there. Sort of like a subset of one. We can call it two, but payroll, payroll admin, because it's money leaving, you know, you're paying people, you're paying your people, not necessarily vendors, but if you have a payroll company, then they're handling that and it's money leaving the account. Right. And I say payroll administration because we're not doing, this role isn't doing HR necessarily. And when we work with larger businesses, payroll might be handled by their HR versus department where a smaller business, probably your bookkeeper or accountant are, are handling payroll for you because there's sure. a lot of compliance in there. Yes, there is. So we, we've had a full episode on payroll. We can go there. We have an episode on <laughs> accounts payable. And then the next one up, we got an episode on that, accounts receivable. Accounts receivable. So that's everything to do with getting paid by your customers, getting money in your bank account from getting your customers. Getting paid. And then the fourth one is transaction booking. So that's all the data input that goes on managing data. We talked about that last episode, that bookkeepers aren't really doing data input anymore. They're like actually just managing data between your different software. And yeah. so, but again, that's data inputs. And then the fifth one is data your facilitation. Facilitation. There you go. I goes. like that. We need to write that down. And then the fifth one is financial reporting. So again, so that's let's go back to those roles. Remember we said we were going to kind of redefine these roles. The bookkeeper was the one on the bottom. The controller was right above them. Where does the controller fit in? The transaction booking, I would think sounds like the bookkeeper, yep. the receivables, the payables, the payroll, all that is somebody it may not necessarily be a bookkeeper but this is where those roles start to blur yep yep because you you may have people you may be working with a bookkeeper but who, you know we have one person internally that does collections or you may have somebody that does a piece of the payroll internally and then you outsource everything out so that's where you really have to define who's doing what in the process because as people start to cross over in their roles there there needs to be clarity and accountability and then the controller kind of comes in as that next function or role. Right. So the controller's doing the financial reporting. So again, man, they're managing whoever's doing the, the whole process of AP, AR, payroll, and transaction booking, making sure it all gets done properly. And then it's all wrapped up in a nice bow so that it can be presented to the business owner. And then the next phase for the growing business is FPNA another acronym? <laughs> Financial planning and analysis. Yep. So, without doing all the other five functions that we talked about, you cannot do this part. And sometimes people, advisors, the good fractional CFOs, right, they get hired and they want to come on and do this type of work. The first thing they do is they look at the financials and say, hey, business owner, I can't do my job because one, two, three, four, and five need to be done correctly. And they may help the business owner get those people in place and those systems in place. But financial planning analysis, I like to think of it as everything forward looking. So that could be forecasting, expansion planning, cash planning, hiring planning. And it's not the same as strategy well, it can be paired with a person that is giving advice, but it can also be separated. So you may have somebody that's doing some financial plan, preparing all of these things because they're good at creating an Excel forecast or whatever tool you're using. And I actually think the cherry on top is 
the business advice that you get from somebody who's been doing something for like 30 years. And if you take all of those, you can continue to push down some of this work to that team, then this person can come on. They don't have to worry about any of that. They can just come on with their wisdom and experience and help advise a business owner reasonably and can be pretty affordable. It can be pretty affordable compared to the costs of hiring somebody in-house too, if you outsource that. Yeah. And it's like, if you can have somebody that's less expensive preparing these things for you, then why not do that? And then have that person come in and spend, you know, a couple hours a week really just doing high level things. So maybe we need to add a seven here and say seven is strategist. Financial strategy, and, strategist. Okay. Okay. So let's go through those again. So there's seven now. I change it from six to seven and we're going to say accounts payable, payroll administration, accounts receivable, financial reporting, which would be everything backwards looking, financial planning and analysis, everything forward looking, and then your strategist. And that's more uh, less about process and more about experience. Mm -hmm. So the strategist, can it be the same person as the person doing FP&A? It can, it can, but by the time someone's been doing this for 30, 40 years, they may not want to be like, you got to be careful there because sometimes you don't want your strategist to be so detail oriented. You want their head above water and really you just think thinking high level. Strategist is like the board of directors in a way, or somebody that sits on the board. Right. Yeah. Some sort of advisor. Advisors. Um, okay. Dope. So how do you go about holding anybody accountable for all this? If it's multiple roles, multiple functions. How do we synthesize all of this? So let's look at an example, something that goes wrong in your business, and then we can tie it back into why this all this is important. A common thing that I see that happens with business owners is they will delegate accounts receivable to, we talked about this in another episode, to somebody, an admin or whomever, in-house at the company. A friend of the family. A friend of the family. Usually it's usually it's an admin, office manager, yeah. spouse, whoever. Probably not a spouse. I think a spouse would probably, this probably wouldn't happen with. Uh, so all of a sudden, a couple of months later, payroll needs to be run and they have no money in their bank account. And they find out, they go look at their AR aging and they have a bunch of old receivables. And so they go talk to that person and they're like, hey, I I told you that you're responsible for accounts receivable and you know what happened here. And so the problem is, is we have not identified the who, what, where, when, and why of all of the steps within accounts receivable. And the who, what, where, when, and why is the who is who is accountable. What is the activity we need to do? Where is the activity being done? So that would be like what software we're using. Is it a Google Sheet, et cetera? When do they do the activity? What's the cadence? And why do we do this activity? I think the why should be first. So the person <laughs> that's doing it really understands what they're doing and why, because that improves the role overall. True. Yeah. When I would everybody just... understands where they fit in the puzzle and why that's important. Right. And it's okay. I like who, what, where, when, why. That's, that's uh, just easier for, because that's usually the order people say it in. For, for remembering. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I originally didn't have the why. So we're, we're looking well, at Simon a Google... Sinek says you start with why. Oh, uh, so. okay. I see. That's why he, I see why you did that. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, so we're looking at a Google sheet here that our, our audience can't see, but basically I've put down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different steps, major steps that are in an accounts receivable process. And one thing, as we're, we're plugging into a client's business, we need to understand of these steps, what is the client doing versus what is momentum accounting doing? And then within momentum accounting, who on our team is actually doing it and when are they doing it and where are they doing it? So if we look at an accounts receivable process, that really starts with sales. So at some point, there's a handoff between sales to accounting. And where does that happen? And then there's also like the follow-up with past due customers. And is that sales responsibility? Is that somebody in admin at the client? Or is that momentum accounting's responsibility? And when there's a breakdown, it's because we haven't defined who, what, where, when, why. 
So let's let's just go through these real quickly. So for example, in the accounts receivable department, who receives the purchase order and where does it get received? Does it get received into QuickBooks Online? Is there a third party system that needs to be managed? Well, remember, let's start with why. Why do we need to do all these activities? Because for somebody that doesn't know what a purchase order is, this starts to all already get confusing. They should know in the title, in the name, what receivable is and why they're doing it. But overall, let's define why. Because if they don't do it right, they're going to run out of money and people aren't going to get paid. Right. Right. If they had that at the top of mind, then these problems wouldn't happen. And they would make sure that they're doing everything right. So let's define that one first. Purchase order. Yeah. So purchase order is typically a customer. If you sell some sort of like supplies or goods or inventory, they may send you a purchase order and say, hey, I want to order 20 pieces of X part. For a business like ours, it might just be a signed contract with a scope of work. What are basically, what is the customer asking for that we've agreed to sell them? So typically that's, you're still in sales at this point. So the client's still managing that uh, in our world. And then I have manages customer contracts there because if you get into complex types of contracts, somebody needs to be managing what you've promised to deliver, right? So we're still like, this is still the client's responsibility in-house right now. We're not getting into the accounting function yet. Then now if I say collects customer payment information, that's when we're starting to get a little bit blurred lines here. And are we still in the what? Yeah, we're in the what right now. Okay. This is what they're doing. So, And then it could be where. So for here, we're collecting customer payment in information so that we can charge them for our, that would be the why, so we can charge them and get paid. And the question is, where are we doing that? Are we entering that into QuickBooks Online or Zero? Are we using a third-party invoicing system? Where is our payment processor located? And who's accountable for that? managing that payment processor, which is another item I have in here. That's an issue that comes up a lot. Clients using a payment processor, but nobody's accountable for following up if a credit card gets declined or something happens. And then they're like, that's not our responsibility. That's your responsibility. Or is it? You know, there's a lot yeah, of gray well, We area talked here. about that last week and how, what kind of problems that could lead to. Right. Unpaid invoices for $14,000. And then we've got creating invoices and adding late charges if you do that who's responsible for creating approving sending like even within that step when i say that there's even more you can break it down there's a lot of breakdowns and I, we don't want to overwhelm people right now mm -hmm. these are just the things that they need to consider and think about within all of these roles and functions of the accounting department all of these have to be really well mapped out planned out and for everything to be a smooth sailing machine with very few people involved too. You've got to have clear systems and clear accountability or else you can have a, a giant mess where you have multiple people and no, everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else and nobody really knows why everything's even being done in the first place. That's right. Yeah. And it all ties back to cash flow. Seems simple when you just say, I need someone to help with accounts receivable, but when you actually break it down, you'll see it's, it's a lot more complex than that to make it all work. Yeah. It's all about the cash flow okay. and keeping all that tight. So how are we going to sum us up today? So going back to those seven roles, I'll say them again, accounts payable, payroll administration, accounts receivable, transaction booking, financial reporting, financial planning and analysis, and strategy. Just go through each of those processes or have whoever's doing them write down the who, what, where, when, why for all of those steps. And then you'll start to identify where there's gray area gaps. And then there has to be somebody's name in each of those boxes. If you're familiar with EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System, you're probably familiar with this of having a name in every box. Uh, so an accountability a, chart. Accountability chart, right? You're, being, you're creating an accountability chart, with, but in, in a more granular level than EOS goes into, right? They're just like, put somebody in the accounting box. <laughs> it's like, what? To kind of explain that too, that's the one person that is held accountable if something were to fall. And that's so they can lead and manage and then hold others accountable. So that's where you get the details after that top level view. You have one person that's sort of in charge of that whole entire department, which could be the CFO. Typically, that's what you see. 
CFO is in charge of the finance department and everybody underneath them has all those detailed out. And that, that would be a good place to, you know, that wouldn't be necessarily on the accountability chart, but it's, it is kind of part of that too. If you level down and you got a lot of details in the accountability chart, you could have each one of these departments listed out too. And who's accountable for those? Yeah. And there's another uh, accountability framework to look into is Rossi, which stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. So accountable is ultimately they're the one at the end of the day where it, it will come back to, but then somebody else may be responsible for actually performing the task. And then you'll have people that may need to be consulted and then other people that don't really need to be involved. They just need to be informed. Sounds like Rasky. Is it Rossi? <laughs> Rossi, R-A-C-I. Rasky. That's what, how <laughs> I, I would pronounce Rocky, it. Yeah. Rocky. Rasky. Racky. <laughs> ra, ra, Degrassi. Rassi. All right. Rossi. So yeah, this is, this is a very, very important foundational understanding of what goes on in an accounting department. It's not just a bookkeeper. It's not just your CPA. It's not just the CFO. It is an, it's a living, breathing organism within your business. I like that analogy. It is. It, and it everything kind of feeds into it. So, you know, maybe the next time we review this, we can go further with the analogy and talk about the blood flow and the heart and what keeps everything going and why and how it could all go wrong and break down and yeah. end up in the hospital. You have to feed the beast, right? You have and to feed the beast. Yeah. It's going to eat all your cash if you don't feed, <laughs> eat it right. I don't know what yeah, that analogy sure. is. I think there's something uh, there. Well, we can keep, we can keep we'll refine that. It. Yeah, as, <laughs> as, as we go. So I hope that you've grown a better understanding of the roles in an accounting department and how they could be looked at or perceived differently. And hopefully you learned something. That's it. That's it. Yeah. That's it yeah. for now. I think there's a lot more can go deeper. We briefly went over the AR process, but I think within one thing I'm working on is creating for each of these functional areas, a list of what are all the steps. And then ultimately I'd like to use that as part of our onboarding process and work with the client and say, oh, so they're really clear because we have a client right now that they had somebody internally managing accounts receivable. So on our proposal, we're like, we're not managing accounts receivable for you. Here are all the other things we're doing. And then the owner comes back to us and is asking us to put to go through and calculate late charges on invoices and put them on the recreate the invoices and send them out. And then CCing customers that are coming into our help at momentum accounting address. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like we never said we were doing that. And she's like, no, no, I wouldn't have signed up with you guys if you weren't going to do this. And we're like, no, you said you were handling invoicing. So in our mind, we're taking that whole, all those 20, the nine steps I just talked about and like you're a hundred percent managing those. So I think having this accountability matrix will clarify a lot of those roles from the get go. So we're not running into those issues later on. Communication problems and accountability issues and miscommunications are always, the, it's always cleaner if you set out the time to plan that and define everything in the beginning, it may take some time but and repeat it. It'll be repeat. better in the end. Avoid headache. All right. Well, we'll see you next time on the Cash Flow Show. See you next time. Peace Have out. a good day. Bye. Issues. You run a business, but feel like it's running you. Customers won't pay. But you got bills due. It appears you won't have enough for payroll coming up soon. It seems like you're running nowhere fast. You work hard, but never able to withdraw cash from the business. You get more customers, hire more employees, but still take home hardly anything. You feel like you're on a hamster wheel, frustrated because the battle's always uphill. Even though you got a bookkeeper on your team, they send you reports, but you don't really know what they mean. Your CPA doesn't understand a thing about your business. At least that's how it seems. But if you want to get above water and grow, check out the Cash Flow Show. This is the Cash Flow Show, where we help the small business gain momentum and become profitable. This is the Cash Flow Show. Listen and learn. We'll show you how to pay yourself on what your business earns. Show. Cash flow. Show.
Just topics like getting paid on time, profitability, and managing your bottom line. Payroll best practices, the best apps to use, and cash flow forecasting tools. So if you're a small business owner, your help's right around the corner. Fret not. Tune in as Scott and Nicole help you reach your goals on the Cash Flow Show. The Cash Flow Show.